Hi guys. We'll do Hello. hi guys. Hi guys. Hey, I'm Anders Miller from Pike Place Fish Company in Seattle. And, and I'm Brian Jar. I'm co-author on the book. And this, wh who should we name this? The Salmon. It's a real star. Sam. Sam, Sam the Salmon. Sam the Salmon. There we go. And Thanks we're, for having us, you guys. This is awesome. You guys have a great campus, and we're really happy to be here. So We're going to throw the fish to get started. Just to let you know, I'm not a professional fish thrower. He is. So check it out. I could mess up. It could be funny. It's like the blooper reel. Ready? TT with the GoPro. TT with the GoPro. Hey, Back Jack. Back Jack. Hey, Do the old twister. Okay, twister. The GoPro twister. TT with the GoPro twister. TT with the GoPro <laughs> twister. Hey, TT with the GoPro <laughs> twister. Hey. Back Jack. Back Jack. Hey, Back Jack. Back Jack. Okay, now we need some volunteers who want to do that. Is there anybody whose bucket list includes catching a salmon? We got right, some people out here. Come on up, you guys. Yeah, come on up. You can wipe your hands when you're done and everything. Come here, you're first. Yeah, we got towels. You're athletic. We thought of everything. No, you're over here. Yeah, you guys go over there. Brian's going to be the uh, coach. You're, and I'll stand be, here. I'll be throwing since I do it for a living. All the way over here. <clears throat> All the way over there. Okay. All right. Do not cross this line. Okay. If you cross the line, I hit you like that <laughs> with the fish, with the GoPro, okay? okay. Ready? Yep. So this is going to come. It's coming the other way, mm -hmm. right? It's coming come at you. Here. Okay, you want to bend your legs? Bend my legs. Like this? Do mm -hmm. you play video games? <laughs> come on. Yeah, there you go. You can admit it. Bam, grab it like you're playing video games. Video games. games. Keep your <laughs> thumbs up video above. video game battle. Okay. Or like okay. catching a baby. Okay. If someone threw a baby, you'd catch the baby, yeah, wouldn't you? I would. You wouldn't let a baby okay. drop. No. Okay. Don't Sam hurt the though. salmon's a baby. Okay. Don't All hurt right. the baby. Keep it. Keep loose. Come All on. Guys, loose. you help loose. me out too with the loose. call and response. Loose video right? game catching a baby. I'm gonna call it out. Okay, there you we guys go. respond. I'm gonna call it TT. That's a test toss or a tourist toss. All right. There we, and, and right, a little He's bit ready. like that. Okay. Yeah. Ready for the flying baby? TT. TT. Hey. Hey. Nice Whoa. work. What's your name? Artur. 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 Yep. Nice. Artur, like there's it. some wipes over there. Yeah. Clean, clean yourself those, up. Artur, you did a good job. Like Who's next? Yeah. Oh, you got the coat on. Guys, the response was a little well weak. Well done. We're going to do better this time, right? You know, it's yeah. fish juice. Okay. That doesn't sound good at all, does it? Fish juice. No. Don't get fish juice on you. Okay. Got it? Remember, these are going to kind of come above. Uh, like when you catch. Okay. Don't, like, don't be afraid to She's squeeze. She's ready. She's ready. You ready? TT! TT! Hey! Oh! Hey. Cradled like a little baby. You did good. Yeah. Cradled like a little baby. Good instincts okay. there. I think I'm done. No, you're done? You did good. You did good. Look, you did good. A little fish, fish stuff on you. That's what the jacket's for. There's wipes over there if you'd like, dear. All right. Back Coming jacket. back. Back hey. jacket. Hey. All right. What's your name? Mike. Mike. How you doing, Mike? Do you want the little jacket on? That's a nice shirt. Come on, I'm that's gonna, a nice I'm shirt. Gonna, Mike, you want the fastball? Okay, wait. Go there. Hey, keep going. Don't cross this line, Mike. Okay. Don't not. There we go. TT for Mike. TT for Mike. Hey. Hey. Pro. Bucket job, list bud. done. Here, before you get all clean. Good job, <laughs> bud. Yeah. There we all go. Right, come nice. On. Come, come on, on chef. Oh, you ready? Bend the legs. Okay. Bend the legs. Get loose. Come get on, loose. Get loose. Get loose. It's okay. Video game hands. Catch a baby. Okay. TT! T -T. T -T. Hey! Yeah. Whoa! Hey. See, you cradled the baby. Yeah. You did good. Hey, well, whatever you gotta do, right? Back Jack! Back Jack! Hey. Hey. Yeah. All right, Cliff. Cliff! He's responsible for this what whole you, thing, huh? Look, you got fish on here already. Blue barracudas. Blue barracudas. Nice. So you want me to so you all sand the salmon. All right. I don't. Wait. Get your foot that way, uh. Cliff. Get your foot that way. <laughs> okay. Hey, wait. Get the sticker off, too. Come here. Uh. Cliff. What's going on? Right. Okay. TT for Cliff. TT for Cliff. Hey. 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 Here, throw it cool. back, Cliff. Oh. Cliff. Hey. All right. Hey. <laughs> All right. Good job. Anyone else? Last, last chance. Okay. Good job, everybody. So, thank you. How many of you guys have been to Seattle before? So, you, I'm sure you all went to the fish market. Everyone in. The, perfect. So we are. Uh, we're the guys that throw the fish, clearly you know that now. And we're also known for having a good time at work, but it wasn't always like that. We, uh, back in the 80s actually, our company was in 
big time financial issues. We were almost bankrupt. And uh, we got approached by a business consultant, uh, Jim Berquist, and he said, let me get you guys out of the hole. Give me two grand a month, I'm gonna get you guys out of the hole. And uh, Johnny at the time was like, he couldn't even make his car payment. He's like, how the heck am I gonna give you two grand a month? So he agreed to bring Jim on, on a two month trial, see if he could turn the business around. And uh, so we brought Jim on. I wasn't there at the time. This is, I've been there 13 years. This was in the 80s. Jim's still with us now. But uh, Jim's whole thing was about human beings and their power to create things, their power of creativity. So what he brought into Pike Place Fish was, was uh, kind of the culture we have now. Um, some of you have probably seen our fish video. You got anybody seen the video? A 17 minute corporate training tape. It's all over the world, but whatever. Um, he brought that into the company and he made us start to realize that we actually had a say in how our experience goes every life. We get a, we get a be say in the matter. So what we did is we came up with a game that was inspiring to us. And, and he said, well, what's inspiring to you guys? What, you know, cause back then everybody was fighting at work. Guys were crying. Um, even Johnny, the owner was making people cry regularly. So came in and said, all right, well, let's create a game that's worth playing something that inspires you. And so we came up with world famous. And uh, it's kind of, you know, some guys laughed at the time. It's kind of funny. How, how are you going to be world famous? You guys are just a little fish market in Seattle. And one of the guys said, well, put it on the side of the box. And they said, well, they're gonna, you can't just put it on the box. They're going to laugh at you. You guys are just this tiny little fish market. But, uh, you know, made that bold statement, put it on the boxes, did a little more brainstorming about what, what does it look like to be world famous. And, you know, to us, it's not like a, you know, Hollywood up on the big screen and things like that. World famous is like, like making a difference for people. Um, world famous customer service. Like what, if you're being world famous, you're going to love your workers. You're going to love all the people that come down. Um, and that kind of just started to catch on. The next thing we know, uh, the Goodwill Games came to town and all of a sudden they wanted to film. And all this, all this media started showing up. Uh, Spike Lee came down, wanted to film a commercial. And uh, the whole thing just kind of started spiraling um, out of control, but in a good way. And we're going, oh my God, maybe, maybe we really do have the power to create things. So, um, I mean, here we are now. We've created a cookbook. You know, it's just that uh, we really believe that um, whatever we set our sights on, we have the power to create it. Yeah. And so the cookbook really came about over a decade ago. They really had an idea to, to, to create a cookbook. And it first came about was, the second most popular question they get, first most popular question is, are you guys the ones that throw the salmon? Are you guys the ones that throw the fish? Second one is, how do I cook this? How do I cook that? I even witnessed one time where there were three ladies visiting and they bought a whole side of a halibut. They spent $300 on a side of a halibut. And then as they were weighing it, they were like, how do I, how do I cook that? I had no clue. And so they all, everyone has their little go-to recipes that they would share, but we really want to encapsulate it in one place. Also, a, back in early 2011, Pike Place Fish was one of the first fish markets in the country to go 100% sustainable. And so we really wanted to show, okay, we can use the cookbook as a vehicle to show people that it's easy to cook seafood, it's easy to handle seafood, these are approachable recipes, these aren't restaurant designed out recipes, and you can do it in a way that's sustainable, good for the oceans, and then good for the world. And so we're here, we have a great one, the Peruvian rockfish ceviche, that we're making today. It's awesome, and so we're gonna be with Jason. He was kind enough to have us here, and, and you're, don't worry if your mango doesn't look like that when you cut it. <laughs> ours, ours would not, but his is awesome, so we're here to That's make it. by a pro right there. Yeah. Ready. You guys ready to go? Yeah, we're ready. Awesome, so uh, we have some nice local California rockfish. Um, we talked about sustainability a few minutes ago. Really important, Google green seafood. Um, we really have a focus on that out here at Google and making sure that we're using things that are sustainable. And we'll talk a little bit more about that yep. later, I think. But sustainability means different things to different people. It's one of those kind of catchwords out there these days and kind of focus on what that means later. So the beginning of the recipe is I'm just going to make this all together, and then I'll show you the steps after we get you guys a little bit of food. So I have the mango right there. So, uh, Fresno chili pepper. And I'll leave a little bit out just so we can taste it later and see how the spice is on it. One thing to always be you know, mindful of when you're doing something like this is everything doesn't necessarily need to go in. It says the recipe at the beginning. Everyone's tastes are a little bit different. And you know, if you have room to play at the end, if you save some. If I put all at the beginning, I can't take the heat out. 
So this gives me an opportunity to be able to adjust the seasoning at the end a little bit. This gets a little bit of salt. And the goal here is um, we don't want a bunch of extra liquid in our ceviche at the end. So by getting some salt in here right now, we're going to let this sit while I do the rest of it. And then some of the water is going to come out of these vegetables and fruits that's in here so our ceviche doesn't get too watered down at the end. Yeah, if you make all your ceviche at first, it's really good, but then that water is just going to water down all the flavors. And so you've had a ceviche before we start coming through and it's just all this water. But when you put in acid and peppers and fish, all that water starts draining out. So we want to separate that. Awesome. Okay, so down here we have the rockfish. Came in this morning. Um, I diced it into half inch cubes. And we want to do this in a non reactive bowl, and that means not a metal bowl. Um, the fish can react, and we can get some off flavors from it, that. You'll get that like tinny metal taste that gets on the fish if it reacts. And rockfish, sustainable rockfish is really good. Snapper, bass, you can do it with halibut. You can do it. There's all kinds of other seafood that you can use. This is great. Kind of fish all around. Rockfish yeah. mm -hmm. is like I, I will take nice Pacific rockfish over a piece of lobster. It's that good to me. Yeah, I agree. and it's inexpensive. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's one thing we try to focus on too. We've got a whole section that kind of just breaks down. A lot of people are scared of seafood. They think it's expensive. They think it's gonna spoil two seconds after you get home, or if you drive home in the car for an hour. You know, so um, rockfish really inexpensive and a really good fish. Yeah, and ceviche is really great too. A lot of people are like, I don't know how to cook fish. They're scared. You're not cooking the fish. Yeah. You know how raw. to chop stuff up and throw it in a bowl, right? There yeah. we go. That's yeah. all you need to know how to do. OK, so once the rockfish is in here, I have some lime zest. I'm just going to put half the lime zest in each one. That's good. A um, little bit That's of olive good. oil. And we have some fish sauce here. And if you've never worked with fish sauce before, go easy the first time. Um, and learn what your flavor profile is for using fish sauce. I personally love fish sauce. But you know it's not for everyone. So once again, I'm going to save a little bit of this for the end, so I can do an adjustment. Because if we get too much fish sauce in, there's no turning back. No turning back. No. And fish sauce is one of those ingredients. Like when you first like smell it, you're going to be like, "Whoa, that's real fishy smelling." <laughs> I mean, it's not like we're like, "Oh, that looks great" or "tastes great." But as it adds into things, it just the flavors that come out of it are are amazing. I was telling Jason, um, you know the like umami, like the sixth sense for your tasting, like sour, sweet, and then there's umami, which is like savory, earthy. The two, two of the things that are highest on the umami scale are Parmesan cheese, Reggiano Parmesan, and fish sauce. Parmesan's like $30 a pound. Fish sauce is, you know, a bottle for a buck seventy-nine. So use fish sauce. And then the last thing we have here is the lime juice. And this is actually what's going to cook our fish. The acidity in the lime juice is going to do the cooking for us. So this isn't something we'd want to make much more than a half an hour yeah. before we were going to serve it. And as you saw, I did all this prep this morning, so this can all be kept separate. You could do most of this a day ahead, do the fish the day of, and then just add you know, your lime juice in right at the end. Once again, I'm going to save a little bit of it so I can adjust my seasoning near the end. Question? <laughs> That's coconut milk. Thank you for yeah. so the coconut. The, the key to this whole thing is we're looking for a balance. Um, of our flavor. So we have the fish sauce, which is umami. Yeah. We have the lime juice, which is our acidity. We have um, the peppers, which are heat. We have the mango, which is sweet. Coconut milk's a little bit sweet. So we're looking for a balance. It's not really, you know, follow the recipe, look at their, I mean, they tested it out, but everyone has a different flavor profile for what they like. So, you know, m make it so you like it. Um, and there's different styles of ceviche, too. This is a Peruvian South American yeah. version. Really nice. So we'll just give this a little bit of a stir. And this for us is like a perfect, it's a perfect summer dish. So today, if you're in Seattle, that's August. Yeah, or today would be like <laughs> our summer, basically. Yeah. The Seattle summer right now, so that's why we're doing it today. That's why I wanted to wear my sunglasses during yeah. the demo. <laughs> Sorry. That looks good. So just get this all nice and mixed up. And then we will go back to our other ingredients that we mixed a few minutes ago. And we'll get that in here. Beautiful. You want me to grab okay. that for yeah, you? Yeah, why don't you grab that for me, Brian? OK, and then what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to use my hands. We're going to lift from the top because we wanted to keep that whatever liquid came off of here at the bottom of this bowl. And once again, just get this in here. As you can see, there's probably twice as much fish, maybe a little bit more to the garnish here. You know, if you want to save yourself a little bit of money, you know, obviously put more of this in than the fish. And then we're just going to mix, finish mixing this together. 
and then we're going to taste it. And then that's the only way we're going to know what we need to do to take it to the next step. Um, and when you're mixing this like Jason's doing, you kind of want to mix it and fold it together. You don't want to, don't go like that because you don't want to break apart the fish. Yeah, handle like baby. Handle Remember? like baby. Like yeah. you're stepping on it's a the baby. same when you're throwing them or when you're, when you're mixing them up. Okay, so now we're at the point where the only way we're going to know how things are is by tasting it. And I really encourage this. When you're cooking at home, you should be tasting your food as you go all the time. I talk to my cooks about this. <laughs> the only way you know how something tastes is to taste it. So if you're having a dinner party and you're putting the food down on the table and you're hoping your guests are going to like it, best of you tried it first. Then you're going to know. And it's you can get the so. guests involved. I always do that at home. Get the guests involved. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, taste this. Let me know. It's good. More salt, more something. I you, like a little you, more salt little in more, mine. You can use a little more salt. Mm -hmm. you and I, I can use more heat, I, personally, but yeah. that's just me, personal preference. Go down the store. Hey, if it, if it burns a, you guys a little a bit, it's pepper. on us. You can blame him. him. <laughs> yeah, we were talking right before, you know, pick the pepper you like. This would be great, you know, depending on the level of heat you like, this would be great with any pepper. I think this would be great with like a habanero because it has yep. that really floral. Yep. But you'd have to watch the heat because one habanero is like Indian ghost all chili. this Fresno yeah. pepper. Yeah. Make sure yeah. you know what you're getting into. I, just I get grew some peppers acidity. and I thought, I was under the impression that they were less hot than a jalapeno. Uh-uh. I ate one whole pepper right off the vine. It was, I ate it in two bites and it was like, it was so bad. It was 20 minutes of torture. Don't, and, don't do that. And when you're growing your own peppers, a lot of it, the heat depends on the soil they come from. So, you know, the peppers that we grow here are similar peppers so they, they took over to Basque country and stuff, but the, the soil isn't the same. So the heat's different. It's like a Vidalia onion versus a regular onion. The Vidalia onion's grown in Georgia. There's not a lot of sulfur in the soil, so the onion doesn't pick up a lot of that, and we have a sweet onion. Peppers are the same way. It's, you know, where you grow something, where the fish swims in the from, ocean, yeah. where the grapes water, come from in your wine, all, that stuff. all of that. It's really where it comes from. So you have a hot big difference. soil. Yes. That's yes. We're going with. You got spicy yeah, soil. Yeah, just you know, a little soil. bit at a time because, like the fish sauce, if you throw too much pepper in there, you're done. You can't really take it out. Do you could, okay. but it would be herbs. Pretty tedious. Um, I'm just going to throw a little of that on top right okay. as we start putting this out, and then okay. I'll do the. Um, cool. Show you cups? guys a little bit of the steps I took earlier today after we're done this. So. You guys want to eat? And then yeah, the, last, the last little bit of so garnish that's going to go on top is I just made some popcorn this morning, made a little uh, cayenne salt on here. So we're just going to garnish the top of this with that. So let's this, this just gives cool so presentation and it gives a texture. Right back here. So this is going to be kind of soft, um, don't matter and then that gives that crunch on everything. Like nine people. Cool. <laughs> Bam. Okay, so I'm just going to move this back here so you guys can start plating. Dish it up. There you go. There we go. She's going to... Um, so yeah, la okay. another little bit of garnish is we have some cilantro here. Just going to strip the leaves off the cilantro. Nice thing about cilantro right, right. is okay. that you can eat just about the whole plant, um, depending on what uh, nationality you're cooking from. They use all the way from the roots all the way up through all the stems. Um, and the last little bit of garnish is some Thai basil, which is just um, basil, but it has a little more of that anise flavor in it that um, regular basil doesn't. So I'm just going to do a cut. It's called a chiffonade. just means to ribbon in French. See how I make that claw with my hand to keep my fingers away from the blade? Blade's always touching the flat part of my finger. That way I don't worry about cutting myself too badly too often. There's a little, there's your ribs for the top. Mm. Okay, so just to show you guys a little bit of the tools that I used to make this today. Microplane, does everyone have one of these at their house? These are really cool, inexpensive, um, and they're great for all kinds of things, grating cheese, zesting citrus. Um, you do have to replace them every once in a while. They do get dull, and you'll sit there, and you'll be rubbing it over something, and you wonder why it's not working. Um, a steel, very important to always make sure you're stealing your knife. Um, when I, I had 10 pounds of fish here this morning. I probably stealed my knife three times, four times, just when I was cutting the fish. Makes your life so much easier. Um, the blade dulls very quickly. So to have a steel, the way you use it, um, 90 degrees. 45 degrees, 20 degrees, always away from yourself. Okay, um, spoon, peeler. So here we go. So we have the mango. The way I do a mango is not like you see in um, 
I don't do the little thing where you flip it inside out or anything. You can't get these nice little cuts. So I just take a top and bottom off, peel it. This is the pull peeler. I prefer them much more than um, the kind your grandmother probably had. I don't know. I don't know how old anybody is anymore. I'm, a certain <laughs> I'm at a certain age, right? It uh, could have been yesterday or it could have been 20 years ago. Um, so the mango has a, the seed for the mango comes right through the middle and it's kind of bulbous a little bit. So you're going to look right along the top here and you'll be able to see where it starts. And you start just about the middle and you kind of wait to see where your knife bites. And then as you cut, you turn your knife a little bit out and then come back around and you get one side, you flip it around, you do the same thing. You kind of want to feel that pit the whole time you're doing it. And then you can get just this little strip off of here. This is delicious to snack on. And then it's going to take the mango and I'm going to cut it like this. And then okay. Don't have that. like this. Turn it, very similar to how you'd cut an onion. And then we just come through here, keeping the tip of the knife on the board. If you guys see how I'm holding the knife in my hand, I don't have it like this. It's not back here. You grab the blade between your finger and your thumb right here. You wrap the rest of your hand around the blade. Okay, this really gives you a lot of control over the knife. Think of it like a hammer. Right, if I hold it all the way back here, I might be able to whack that nail, but I'm probably going to get my thumb in the process. So the more you have control over the blade, so that's my Mango, do the same with the rest of it. Um, lime, when you're using the microplane, all you really want to do is you want to grab just the outer peel of the citrus. The, the pith, the white part right below is bitter. So we only go across the mango, uh, whatever we're doing, one time. And you can see how I'm taking off the dark green, but it still kind of looks light green under there. I'm not going to sit here and go like this. See how deep I can get, okay? We don't want to do that. Just once over the outside. Tap it out. Don't cut me. Not going to. Okay. Um, um, English cucumber. Um, we use an English cucumber today. It has a lot less seeds in the center of it. It's a lot easier to work with. If you have a regular cucumber, it could be all the same thing. Um, once again, I peeled it, cut it in half, had a spoon, scooped out the seeds. Same thing when I'm cutting this, is I'm going to cut this into one to equal sizes, then I line them up. This uh, cucumber is a great thing to practice on, or something like this, because it's long, it's easy to work with, they're not too expensive. You can really work on your knife skills. So the first thing is I, I grab the food, and I roll my fingers up into this, what we call a claw. So the blade, as you can see, the blade of the knife is always going to be along my fingers like this. Okay, so I don't actually move the knife, I move my fingers. Okay, and the thumb kind of goes behind. We always make sure we tuck the thumb. And the thumb is what kind of holds on to the food so that I can drag my fingers toward my thumb. Okay, that's that. And then we have uh, a chili pepper right here. Um, I would suggest, I'm not going to do it right now, but having some gloves at your house. Very great for if you're working with any kind of peppers. These things are hot on the inside. They get on your hands, and then you can touch sensitive parts of your body. Yeah, we just did a video shoot, and they didn't have paper towels or anything. And I was cooking, I was cutting serranos for a different recipe, and then I did not. It was not good. Right. I mean, I, my nose was basically draining on the right, and camera. The, and the eyes are the least of your worries when it comes to that. So um, I just pull the, the seeds out. And then just the same thing. It's the same technique, just used on different parts of the different fruits, vegetables. I stack it back up so that I can just come right through. OK, so that's basically how we did all the little steps up to where we got when we threw it all into the bucket for you guys. So how's it taste so far? Is it good? Good. Yeah, and okay, these are all, I mean, one? Okay, yeah. over there. The popcorn, there you go. <laughs> I, um, I made it in a 40-quart stock pot. <laughs> so I had a stock pot that was about this big around and about this tall, and I just put some oil into it, threw the popcorn in, turned it up on high, put a sheet pan over the top of it, and popped it. I don't have a popcorn popper at my house. If I need popcorn, I pull out a pan with a lid, and I make popcorn. Yeah, it's, it's really, really easy to make. You don't have to have you know, a fancy machine to make your popcorn. 
Anyone have any questions about the cooking portion of it? Yeah. Why the coconut milk? The coconut milk is just, I love coconut milk, so why not? But um, it's part of the balance we talked about. You know, we have the spicy, we have the acidity, we have the sweet. And, you know, coconut milk is a little bit sweet, but it also carries the flavors all the way through. It's kind of a base note almost to our dish that we can build on top of. Um, you know, a lot of ceviche you get is, is very acidic because the, you know, the acid's in there to cook the fish. In this one, you know, it's more about a balance. It's more about achieving that balance of flavors and the coconut milk really helps with that. And then on top of it, it's delicious. So does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Um, Who's hanging out? Do you guys permanently smell like fish and get complaints from your significant others to bathe? Uh, I pretty much smell like fish a lot. I mean, my hands, it's hard to get the smell off my hands. It, it takes a, a vacation mm -hmm. with the ocean involved for several days. Mm -hmm. But as far, I mean, my significant other, I met her at the fish market, so she kind of knew what she was getting into. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not too bad. Plus the smell, we, we say that's the sweet smell of success. Everything that I, everything I do, every vacation I go on, everything's paid for by that smell, so. Well, I was gonna say you love it. Though. Yeah, you learned it. You learn to love it. Yeah. After the Thanks. cookbook, we're going to come out with a cologne line. Yeah. It's going to be, it's gonna be amazing. No, it's funny, we'll though. People, people actually send us little sample products, and everyone's got these little gimmicks of things that are supposed to get fish smell off your hands. And I, I haven't really found anything besides, like, going in the ocean for several days, which just kind of does it all. Yeah. Anybody else? I had a question for the three of you as far as, so we, we have awesome copies of your cookbook now, but my main question when it comes to using cookbooks is like, how do you, if, if you just want to make something out of the cookbook, but you're not in the mood for anything specific, what is your recommendation on, on where to start? You know, like how do you just kind of like, other than just going through the entire book and finding something at random, like do you start off with the main component to the dish? Do you start off with how it's cooked? Like what, what is your preferred approach? I would do, component or actually if you're just like I just want to you know I mean try something kind of towards the back there's a thing called the basics mm -hmm. and it has lots of their like seafood the pike place seafood seasonings broken down which a lot of times you'll have those you know what I mean in your pantry um, some of the sauces and then I mean the great thing about really good seafood is if you bake it for just a little bit or saute it for just a little bit or grill it for just a little bit and don't overcook it Number one thing someone people do is they overcook their fish. Don't overcook it. Remember, you go to a sushi restaurant, you eat it raw. So don't overcook it. And then use one of the marinades. Use one of the sauces. And that's a real basic way to get started instead of staying like, oh, I'm going to do the clams with breadcrumbs and lemon zest, and i got to you know, get all those parts. And then you can kind of move into, you know, you're planning a dinner party, and you're like, oh, I really want to prep for this. But if you're just home, go to one of those. Usually it's just a few basic things. gives great flavor. Right, and creating a relationship with somebody is a good way to do it too that we talk about in there. Like, you know, how do you, how do you get good fish? Um, how do you know if you're really buying what you think you're buying, um, if it's mislabeled or whatever? There's been issues with that recently. But, uh, you know, just go find a fishmonger or go to the grocery store and start creating a relationship with somebody and get to the point where you can trust them and, and uh, go to them for recommendations. Because like Brian said, we've, we've got all these rubs and all these different recipes in the back that are a basic sauce or seasoning that will go on all types of seafood. So, you know, you build that relationship and then you can, if you're not feeling inspired, like I have people that come to me every day and like, man, what's fresh? What should I cook right now? And then by the time they leave, they're inspired and, you know, go grab a couple lemons and use one of the rubs in the back of the book and you're, you're good to go. All right, great, thank you. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, first one is, are you guys hiring? <laughs> and second question is, uh, what are the job requirements to be called official Pike Place fish guys or gal for that matter? Yeah. Fish, fish wife. We learned that. <laughs> yeah. The Fem real. Female fishmonger is called a fish wife. Fish wife. Okay. I always thought it was like someone that was married to a fishmonger, but that's <laughs> not it. Um, we, I say we're always hiring. You never know. You, so bring a resume, but uh, <laughs> no, we, we hire very infrequently. Everybody that works there sticks around for a long time. Like I, um, I've been there for 13 years and I'm just kind of in the middle. I mean, there's guys that are 25, 26. Yeah, 26 years, 25, 19. Yeah. It's a career. Dickie, the boss, he just retired and he's, uh, he's been there 30 plus years. We were all sad when he, le when he left. We were all crying in the work meeting. Oh, Dickie's leaving. And then like two days later, somebody called him and asked him to work for him. He shows he back up at the fish farm. He, we're like, man, I, we're he crying. He totally worked the going away party. Yeah, he did. I was at the going away party too. I was like, people are crying. And then 
Three days later, I'm down getting stuff from the, I was like, what are you doing here? It's like, oh, my wife doesn't really, she gets kind of, she doesn't like me home all the time. I was like, okay, so now he works like three days a week. But the, the second part of the question is we, we, there's really no requirement. I mean, you gotta show up on time. Um, we literally will take a resume and we'll call the first person that answers the phone. They come down and they basically, they're trying out for the job. You know, it's kind of like they have, they have to make the team. We're a really tight knit team. Our whole thing is all about teamwork and, and uh, making a difference. Like how can I make a difference for that person over there? Whether it be your coworkers, um, everybody that walks by the fish market, whether they're buying fish or not, you know, so can you work on a team? Um, can you commit to something that's bigger than yourself? Because, you know, you're going to wake up at 5 a.m. It's going to be cold and wet out, and you can go, well, this sucks. Or you can go, okay, I'm committed, I said, and go make a difference anyway. So we're kind of looking for people that are willing to, to try things a new way and just go have it be about, about the people. So. And you can't go on vacation in December. Yeah. I would say that. December. No, yeah, December like vacations, they're slammed. Oh. They, everyone works every day. For like going up to Christmas, it's crazy there. Yeah, so if you got like a Christmas holiday you normally go on, and you want to work at the fish market, we're probably not going to hire you. <laughs> okay. Right there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. So I was born and raised in Seattle, so I grew up like catching the plush fish and um, doing all that stuff with you guys. So thanks for always being there. Um, I just had a couple questions. One, what is that fish? That's like the chomping fish. The monkfish. Monkfish. Oh yeah. The scary monkfish. Yeah, I remember it scaring me when I was little, yeah. and then just laughing at the kids now. They, like suckers. Nice. And it's crazy now because that when they went, when Pike Place Fish went 100% sustainable, monkfish is not a sustainable caught fish. So they had to get rid of it. And the monkfish was gone. And, and that became the, the most asked question. Yeah. Instead of where do they throw the fish or how do I cook that? It's like, now it's like, where's the monkfish? Yeah. And so they had a, what is a company that does things for film and the aquarium. And they built like a $2,000 realistic looking fake monkfish. But now it's permanently at the market. It's crazy. It's it better exactly too, because like it's got, the teeth are fake. And the, those old monkfish, they actually had real teeth on them. And sometimes you can't see what's going on down there. You pull the string and someone's got their finger in there. So <laughs> we've had a couple injuries and you know, just nasty monkfish teeth ripping your finger open is bad. So we don't have to worry about that ever again. And my second one is, what is your secret to your smoked salmon? I've tried like nine recipes and there's like something about it. I used to work on Fifth and Pine, so I'd always go down oh. there and get smoked salmon and Beecher's mac and cheese. It was like the perfect lunch. Um, nice, that's a good one. But that's what is like lunch. your secret? <laughs> it's a secret. Yeah. Damn it. Okay. It's in the book. I'm just kidding, it's not in the book. No, it's a, basically, it's just a great recipe. We've been, we've been buying from the same people. They smoke our salmon for us. And I'd say the most important factors are, we always use alder, which is really good. We don't make it too salty, and we use big, fatty, awesome king salmon. Like, we buy 18 up. That means they're over 18 pounds. They're going to be nice and fatty king salmon. And so if you start, a lot of people don't want to smoke good quality salmon. You know, people buy chum or um, a lower grade salmon because they say, oh, well, I'm just going to smoke it. But we... And then it's going to taste like that. Yeah, and then it's, that's why you get a lot of, like, kind of dry. Seems like it's been smoked too long. We use big, fatty king salmon so they don't dry out. So if you start with the awesome wild king salmon in the beginning, you're going to end up with it. A lot of people smoke farm-raised salmon too, so we don't carry any farm-raised salmon. Hello. So I had a question for you guys. So my boyfriend's from Maui, born and raised, and he does not eat fish. And my family has a fish market. So I'm wondering if you guys could suggest some type of fish that's kind of an easy kind of little baby step for him, you know, that's not super fishy. Something that tastes kind of like spam. That I, no. exactly. Yeah. You got to slip it in a spam he, masubi. He wants there you to go. eat locomoco all day, you know, and I, I Me eat too. fish. I don't eat meat, <laughs> right? So I was wondering if you guys could suggest something with a little bit of the island flavors man. that I can make and kind of just trick him one night. I think some, uh, man, start with like uh, some black cod. Butterfish, you ever had the black cod? Um, possibly. I mean, it's, I eat any type of fish. Yeah, it's so good. It's like a... You know, it flakes like salmon. It's white fish. It flakes okay. like salmon, but it's really buttery. It's almost like a like Chilean sea bass. Okay. Really nice and rich like that, but it's totally sustainable. You can get it all up and down the Pacific coast. Okay. And uh, it lends really well to like sweet marinades. Okay. So that might be something, you know, you could go start off with like teriyaki or do like a uh, like a miso. We, yeah. got that, we got that brown, the butter and uh, miso. Oh, miso soy. sake. Okay. Or yeah, or yeah, sake soy butter sauce. Okay. Equal parts and you spread that on anything. He'll never you, know, right? Yeah. No. And then okay. put it right on, oh man, put it right, right under yeah. the broiler until it's just about crispy, like it's about to burn. Okay. That's another good thing too. If you don't cook a lot of fish, um, 
you can cook black out and just cook it and cook it and cook it and you won't dry it out because it's got it's really healthy it's got a lot of omega-3 in it so it's a good it's a good uh, beginner fish, and it's also just, it's my favorite fish. Okay, I'll, thank yeah. you. I'll try it. Thanks Albacore for coming, Albacore tuna is a good one, too. Okay. It's sustainable on the Pacific Coast just because it's not as uh, rich as, like, your ahis and ones like that. You know okay. what I mean? It's lighter color, and yeah. so it just has that kind of buttery, rich flavor. Nice. Saki soy butter, though. I'll if he doesn't that. like it with saki soy butter, then you might want to rethink them. Right. No, yeah. I don't kind of <laughs> Rethink them. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Hey, uh, just a question on like other parts of the fish, because I know fillets are what you use. So what do you suggest for the parts that you usually throw out? Because when I was once in Singapore, they were doing like the fish head curry, which is really popular mm -hmm. there. Like, you know, is there is there anything like adventurous that we could do with the fish? Yeah, we we, we hate now that we're telling people. That uh, yeah, we're giving giving away secrets. <laughs> the the collars are some of the most incredible part of fish. And a lot of times, we always say at the market, someone's buying a $300 salmon, and then the head's chopped off, and then they lose all the collar. And collars like broiled or sake sweet butter sauce or with a little bit of sauce, and they're just cooked. All the fat and the oil is in that collar area, and it just, it, like he said, it doesn't dry out. It's amazing. Um, the heads and the bones are really good for stock stocks. and a lot of oil in there. You know, like we sell, we sell salmon heads, too, for a dollar, because a lot of people, they buy a salmon, and they don't want the head. But then we have, you know, other customers that come by and they're, they're cleaning up on that. You know, the guy just, that head weighs like two pounds sometimes, you know what I mean? So they come get a two, two pound head for 50 cents. Uh, the bones are really good. A lot of the meat that's right up next to the bone is great. Like on a salmon, after we fillet them, we'll take a spoon and just go along the back and you get that good meat. You can make like salmon patties out of it. Um, just, you could use it all. You can use it, yeah, everything. I mean, we don't even, like Dungeness crab shells, and then you blend the shells up to make crab stock, like crab bisque. Uh -huh. And then it's just a little bit of crab meat in it, but like people taste them, and they're like, oh, that tastes amazing. And it's literally hard crab shells keep blending through. You know, that's one thing is about being sustainable and trying to educate people about seafood in general is we want, we found that a lot of people are scared and they don't really know how to handle fish or they haven't cooked a lot of it. So um, there's a big primer on like how to pick out fish at the at the store, like what you should be looking for, um, how to break it all down and use all the different parts of the fish, all those little tricks in there, so so that it's not scary to make fish. I have a little follow up on that. So what would yes. you say if you didn't really trust your fishmonger or you hadn't built that relationship yet? How would you go into a market and be able to tell that something that was a fresh fish? Well, I'd, I'd right here first. You know what I mean? You go in there, it shouldn't smell. There, there should be. It should smell like fish, but it shouldn't smell fishy. You know what I mean? It shouldn't smell, it, you know when something doesn't smell right. So I yeah. would say that, that would be the first thing. Um, if you're looking at like whole fish, they shouldn't have, you know, a bunch of scale loss. That means that, that uh, it's been handled a lot or maybe thrown <laughs> a lot. But um, yeah, so I would look for that. Um, you know, you can open it up, make sure if there's any bloodline on it. Like, I, like we always leave the bloodline on our yellowfin tuna so that you can tell whether it's fresh or not. So. Um, you know, I'd look for some bloodline on there. It should be nice and bright. The gills should be bright. Um, no blood in there. It should be dark brown and nasty. You know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. looks like it hasn't been sitting around for a little bit. Eyes nice and crisp. Yeah. But cool. then when you're building the relationship with the fishmonger, if they can't answer simple questions about where it came from, all those types of things, then skip ahead. Find Same someone with the restaurant. else. Yeah. Same with the restaurant nowadays, especially in an area in like West Coast or San Francisco. If they can't tell you where it came from, how it was caught quickly, then go, you know what I mean, skip ahead. We actually even, when we were just in New York, we went to a restaurant and we were going through the menu, sushi place, and we're like, our, it was a huge menu and it just got cut to about this big for us because all of the choices were not sustainable. It was like they were trying huge. to be not sustainable. Yeah. It was crazy where I was like, man, I don't even know what we, what we can order. That's our next cookbook, yeah. uh, not to be sustainable. <laughs> no, just kidding. <clears throat> but if that's important to you too, the sustainability thing, we. You know, we take it really serious. It's an important thing if you want to be able to keep eating fish. So um, there's apps. You can download an app for your phone. You know, and we were literally doing that at the sushi joint the other night. We're, okay, nope, can't do that one. Yeah. And then, you know, it'll say, well, you can do it if it's from this location and not that location. So you ask the waitress, and she, if she doesn't know, then you probably shouldn't order it. Another one that we always tell people that's an easy one to tell so like when Copper River salmon season comes or some of these ones that, you know I mean, are kind of marketed well and known, if you go into multiple places and it's all about the same price, 
and then you go to one place and it's half the price, or like $10 a pound cheaper, you, you're most likely 90% getting duped. They didn't get some special one they got in at a cheaper price. If they tell you that, they're most likely lying. And so if you see big price, you know, like, oh, they always have it at this, but these people have it at this cheap, they're probably passing it off as something else. And that's one way to tell. So I think you did a, a really great job talking about what individual consumers can do to make their um, seafood choices more sustainable. Um, how about on the national policy front? Like, what are some of the, the huge issues facing us right now? And you know, what are some solutions for those? Overfishing is a giant one. And then that's a, I mean, overfishing, to especially, I mean, take a sample, you know, I mean, example like tuna, right? Tuna doesn't just hang out in the United States or hang out in one country. It takes over the whole Pacific Ocean. So there's these huge areas, and it's gotten more and more expensive as sushi's gotten more popular all around the world. And overfishing is going to be a huge thing, and that has to be a policy on a national scale and an international scale. Countries have to come to agreement on marine sanctuary areas where you can't fish or fishing seasons where they limit them. Like Alaska is a really great place because it really manages their fisheries, really manages how many salmon are caught, what the salmon runs look like, what black cod runs look like, when you can do Alaska spot prawns, all those different items. But tuna, because it travels so far, it's really hard to kind of track like, oh, we're doing it great in the US, but then it goes down in the Southeast Asia, and, and then it, you know what I mean, fish boats are out and they're taking, you know what I mean, and taking a bunch of them. And that, I think overfishing is going to be a big one. Um, also a big, big one on places and look out for, is how do they farm certain seafoods? So salmon farming's gotten bigger and bigger as salmon's gotten bigger, but farm salmon pollutes the water, interbreeds with other salmon, and um, passes on disease. They pass on sea lice, uh, farmed shrimp, and things like that in Southeast Asia are done in chemicals. They pollute waterways. That's actually the worst. And yeah, it's only, worse. And they, it's, just, they just go and they dig a pit and they fill it with seawater and they raise shrimp in it till the water is too disgusting for the shrimp to live. And then they just move yeah. 20 feet down the ever, beach and dig another hole. If you ever go out to a restaurant again. and you're like, oh, I think I got sick because I ate shellfish or seafood, I'm allergic to shellfish, it could be because it just came from Southeast Asia and it's how they produced it. It's one it's of the terrible. Five, five dirtiest foods in the world. And it's everything that comes into America, about 2% of it actually gets inspected. So definitely, you know, just ask. If they're, not, if they're not labeling what kind of shrimp it is on the menu or what kind of salmon, you know, if you have some awesome salmon in your restaurant, you're going to want to tell people about that because that's a selling point. If it just says salmon or it just says shrimp in a dish, I would ask because most likely it's, or it's if, naughty stuff. If it says all you can eat, yeah, yeah. all you can eat. You, yeah. prob you can eat. probably guess yeah, that the, all you can eat, all you can yeah. eat, the, probably not the most sustainable product. Yeah. They're terrible. And don't buy fish on sale. Go buy, buy clothes on sale. Don't, don't go looking for fish on sale. Yeah, but there's a reason. They're trying to get rid of it. Another good one. Anybody else? Just to touch on that Alaska, they really, yeah. it's like a cooperative up there. So when all the fishing boats go out, they have their quotas, but it's not, a, it's not who gets back first with everything. It's all more of a big cooperative, and that's how they really manage that they, up there. And it's, it's a billion, you know, billion and billion dollar industry, and they want it to keep going. Mm -hmm. They don't want it to just go away. Well, even that one's getting a little scary, too, because now they're, you know, they're drilling for oil up there. Yeah. They're, they're uh, talking Mining about the for, pebble mine, yeah. you know, which could wipe out Bristol Bay sockeye, which is like the biggest sockeye salmon run in the world. That could be in danger. So, you know, it's really important. Those are important issues. So get your sockeye now. Yeah. <laughs> I would just say on the end of that, the best way, I mean, for us personally is, you know, we vote with our wallets every single day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if everyone on the planet was voting with their wallets to eat sustainable seafood, people wouldn't be farming salmon here yeah. and they, they wouldn't be digging up beaches to you know, raise shrimp in. Those things just wouldn't happen because there wouldn't be a market for it. Yeah. So I know you only seem like one person, but you know, it does make a difference. And we always talk, we talk about in the book too, it's if you have a really good piece of like king salmon or sockeye salmon, serve a four ounce piece and then have other things. You don't need a farm raise like, oh, I got farm raise at this much per pound and I want to, you know, everyone to have a 12 ounce piece of salmon. You don't need that. A, it, the flavor's terrible. And if you just had a four ounce piece, it's gonna taste nicer. And then we also talk about in the book, or for seafood, like every day, like clams, mussels, types, those types of things, you put that in pasta, that's easy and inexpensive. 
and, and very fully sustainable. sustainable yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's kind of one of our hopes for the book too. Is you know we we have a national listing from doing our books and videos and our corporate training and all that kind of stuff. So we could have easily put together a collection of recipes and it would sell because it has our logo on it. But we actually want to educate and let people know, like Jason said, is you you make a difference every time you make a decision on what you buy. You make a difference. So. You know, hopefully we can get to the point where it's not more expensive. It shouldn't be more expensive to do the right thing. You know, it should be cheaper to be sustainable. So that's, you know, that's hopefully where we're headed. Should we sign some books? Yeah, you guys ready for that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'm ready. They have to get back to work sooner or later. Maybe well, not. <laughs> or You've only been out here for or, a little while. Or beach Thank volleyball. Or beach volleyball. Thank you. Thank you, guys.